So today I'm joined by not my twin or I, I look at it more as like a the alternate reality version of me. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and it kind of ties. <laughs> my in wife with, does too. She's like <laughs> freaked out. Like <laughs> she sees photos of me, and vice versa. Yeah, it, we kind of it kind of ties in with like what we were going to talk about today. With we have very similar setups, mm -hmm. but at the same time they're very different, and we kind of yeah. wanted to dive into that a little bit so it, it's kind of fitting that we're we're often mistaken for one another when yeah when it's very similar totally yeah yeah for sure uh so for those of you who don't know this is trev lee uh trev works for the dark room uh and if you're familiar with this channel you're more than familiar already with the dark room and everything um we do a lot of like live streams on instagram together and um generally just are always talking photography and talking cameras and yeah and it started right around uh the idea yeah yeah, yeah in 2019 like, so mm -hmm. right at 2019 we had never we had spoken a couple of times mm -hmm. but we had never met until uh actually being there in san clemente at the dark room uh, which was funny because people were coming up to you Mm -hmm. They knew I was there speaking. It was just making it. It was really funny at first. Then eventually, I'm like, dude, you're like the millionth person. <laughs> Everyone was walking up to you as if you were me. And then a second time later that year, I went to the dark room to shoot a video. You and had your as, glasses. Yeah, and I had the 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 blue <clears throat> like the the blue light blocking glasses. And as I walked through the dark room, people were like, oh, hey, Trev. Like, they thought you were in town, mm -hmm. you know, for Especially work. Especially if it's peripheral. Like, yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah. And I had a hat on and glasses and stuff. Uh, now it's a little bit different. But, um, but yeah, Trev is in town visiting family. You're originally from Ohio. Mm -hmm. Three hours north of here. Yeah. So northwest. Right. So while he was in town, we had to get together and uh, do some kind of video together. So he drove down to Chillicothe for the day. And we've just been walking around all morning shooting photos and... Uh, Thought it would be a good time to kind of break down essentially our everyday carry kind of setups because all of the whole, you know, it's like a very similar setup, but also very different. Um, I have an M6, he has an M5. I prefer 35 millimeter, you prefer 50. I shoot HP5, he shoots Tri-X. So it's like, it's all of these almost the same, but yeah. also uh, kind of the, again, the alternate alternate reality version. Yeah, it worked <laughs> out because when I was coming out here, I was like trying to think about what we could talk about and I was like, oh, it's like, there's so many comparisons here. Yeah. And there's no, the cool thing is there's no right or wrong. Right. They're just, they're so close to each other. It's just like comes down to pre like little preferences. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I mean, ultimately <clears throat> over the years, even on this channel, I don't really say this is the best camera for everybody or this is the best film stock for everybody. Mm -hmm. Everything in regards to photography, it's so subjective, you know, totally. and it really does come down to personal preference, which to me, I find that way more interesting than specs because you could take a camera that may have less specs than another, but you know. Yeah, it's not all about, I mean, that's what's even with like the dark room, we were talking about this earlier where I get to shoot a yeah. wide variety of film, wide variety of cameras, and there's always like someone would be like, this is the best, or that's the best, or why would they, like, why would you share this? Cause this is a better film. And, like, that's the cool thing. You don't have to like everything. Yeah. It's cool that like, if, it's good if that this we still was have all variety. there was, yeah. that'd be a bummer. Like right. there's, we were talking about, there's like some film stocks that I personally don't like. Right for myself, but it's awesome that others like it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I love HP5, and I know people that hate HP5, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And, and, and I've shot film stocks that I normally wouldn't use, but sometimes I might make a photo with something that is kind of out of the ordinary, which is, yeah, it's, it's just fun. So mm -hmm. uh, I guess for starters, we can kind of talk about some of this. Um, the M6 for me, kind of being I and mean, it was like a dream camera for a long time and it's been my everyday carry kind of camera for the last seven years and it really checks a lot of boxes for me in terms of what I would want in like an everyday mm -hmm. camera uh, and it does have some limitations that maybe it would be better if uh, I had something faster than one one thousandth of a, <laughs> of a second you know uh, a lot of other cameras have one two thousand one four thousand even mechanically like the fm2 yeah. that we always yeah. talk about yeah, that totally. um you know there, there are a lot of different trade-offs but all around in terms of the trade-offs you know the pros and cons and everything this has really just been it for me um and the m5 for you it kind of checks all of your own boxes 
Yeah, totally. Well, first, it's cool that we're starting with cameras because I feel like people are going to see, like, oh, we're comparing this, but the coolest stuff we're going to be <laughs> comparing photo-wise is the lenses and the film. The film because like both of these cameras will take the same photo. Yeah. It just comes down to ergonomics, price, avail availability as well. Like this yeah. is what was available to me. And um, and I fell in love with it. I don't think it actually, the M5 probably wouldn't have been the one that I picked if it, if it, if they're just like pick a camera because right. I hadn't heard much about it. There's a lot of hype yeah. about these cameras and for a good reason. And I had only heard about, you know, M3 and M6. Right. I was going to say the M5, it's it's overlooked, but I don't think, it, it definitely doesn't get as much credit as it deserves. Granted, yeah. it's very different, but... Yeah. And I can go into why. Yeah, yeah. I mean, please. so this, this uh, was, I think it was 71 to 75, I believe. So it wasn't made for long. It was not well received. Uh, it was not well liked. It's kind of a it, whoops. Never yeah, mind. <laughs> yeah, and it. I always joke around. That's like the ugly duckling of Leicas. Um, a lot of people just like who are in the Leica don't like this camera as much, and that's because clearly they went it, very. They went a different direction, in some good and some like it's opinion, but bad ways as well. Yeah. Um, it looks different. It's larger. The reason why it's larger is because it's the first. Um, like a with a meter yeah and it's it's kind of funny having these next time and bring it up this is the ttl right but that which is kind of confusing it's ttl for the flash this right. is the first ttl leica right because it's through the it's lens through the lens meter, but not right? on the flash so right it, this is the first leica with a meter uh like an m yeah. and its meter is awesome as an eight percent uh spot meter and it shows in the viewfinder as exposure needles compared to your LCD readout arrows. A little LED, yeah. Or LED, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah the little dot bad. and arrows there. The needle is, it's a totally different kind of setup, and I hadn't thought about it, but you mentioned earlier, like, on the scale where those needles are, mm -hmm. you can kind of see the distance, which is going to tell you how many stops yeah. if you're over or under, whereas this you kind of have to adjust it until you see the circle light yeah. up. Yeah, because if the way that this works, for me at least, is like I will hit like basically uh, even exposure once the lines cross. Right. And then I can open up a stop on my shutter because I typically have my aperture where I want it and yeah. I move my shutter. Same. And then when I open up a stop, I see that space. And then over time, you're like, oh, that's a stop. That's two stops. Yeah. And you don't have to think about that that much. And then on top of that with shutter speeds, this shows the shutter speed in the viewfinder. Yeah. Unlike M6, the M7 does, but only in aperture priority. Ah, oh, I didn't um, know that. I've never yeah. shot with the M7. Yeah. I didn't know it actually had a readout for the It does, the but just but only for... Only aperture. Yeah. And that's, that's why this has the little light window. That's what that's for. That's I wondered what that ambient, was letting light yeah. into. Okay. And that's for the needles. Right, um, right, right. And probably the shutter speed as well. Yeah. And then speaking of shutters, this one ergonomically is better than anything prior to it. I think so. That, because it has the bigger shutter Which dial. Which is another one of those some people would say, would argue the exact opposite. Yeah. But personal preference, that was... Yeah, that's true. That was one of the things that I liked about the TTL version versus the classic was that I could adjust the shutter speed with mm -hmm. a single finger, and it, it sits not flush, but just about flush to the front of the body, whereas the previous M's, aside from the M5, there's always that... There's like should be a little asterisk next to the M5 because yeah. it's so different, different in its own kind of way. Um, but all of the previous M bodies from the M4 and before were uh, a much smaller and further back. And you have to take your hand you kinda, off. Yeah, yeah, you have to use like two fingers. And this to me is just a much more convenient way. And same with this. So this has yeah. right there, it overhangs, which is kind of nice. Yeah. And you don't have to take your thumb off of... Uh, oh, you don't for that either. But for the other than this one, it's yeah. nice. This is also, it's an interesting thing. I don't use it too much but it's the last one with a um self timer right i and didn't realize that earlier until you mentioned that either yeah so it has a self timer just like the m4 does mm -hmm. and this is it's the same as the m4 same viewfinder i believe and yeah. these are the same like same pieces same pieces yeah 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 and then 
obviously it loads in the bottom just like this, but it, the, rewind. the rewind is right there. It's yeah. concealed. Whereas mine and like most M bodies, aside from a couple, you know, the older ones or the MP where you have mm -hmm. the sort of like the little um, little cutout right there. This one is that slanted style, which I'm pretty sure was first introduced on the M4, mm -hmm. if I remember right. Um, the last thing is that I can think of that's a perk with this that I like and some people do not is the side lugs. Yeah, that's true. So like the side lugs, it's preference, but I prefer the side lugs because I don't... You don't have anything on the right side. Yeah, I don't have anything in here. You don't have to choose like where your finger is going to go. Right. Um, which it depends. Like for me, that is, it might not bother you at all. It might fit yeah, perfectly yeah. so it's good or you have that security. Right. Um, but it's nice that for it's free on this side. Yeah. It is a bigger camera. I'm right. not a big person. I don't have big hands. If yeah. I were to, if someone that was, you know, tall, larger person than me was wanted a recommendation, I would 100% recommend this camera. Right. Because size might not be necessarily an issue, and it's going to be cheaper. True. Um, and it yeah. will still take just as good of photos. It's just you know. Yeah, I mean, you your your film camera body is really just giving you access to whatever format it's shooting, whether it be 35 or mm -hmm. medium format or large format, I guess. But um, more than anything, the, the lens mount, you know, yeah. that's, that's really that's what- That's the value of these cameras. Exactly, the part. exactly, yeah. So if, if your main concern is, is just getting access to that mount, um, you can really, you have a lot of different options there in terms of camera bodies, not just from Leica either. Yeah. You know, you've got other manufacturers that have the same mount, so. Um, again, it kind of all comes down to personal preference and, and what what your priorities are, I guess. Well, and outside of looks, as you can see, yeah. size is the biggest thing. And that's the only thing that really gets me is yeah. the fact that this is a large camera. Ideally, I mean, it's lofty because, you know, these aren't cheap cameras by any means. Right. Um, I would love to have forever have this <laughs> lens, this camera, and be black and white. And, and then and, another. Yeah, but, you know. Yeah, we're, we're, we also have kids. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, um, but but uh, like we were talking about, the the biggest thing is the lens. You mm -hmm. know, like that that's really what you're what you're getting when you're shooting film anyway. In terms of like choosing your camera, this is inside here. This is just a box. The same way that's just a box that's going to let in light. You know, mm -hmm. um, so the lens options. I mean, there are tons and tons of great. Uh, M-mount Leica lenses. There are tons of great lenses from other manufacturers as well. Um, but more than anything, we wanted to kind of talk about essentially the focal length because yeah. you, on here you have a 50 millimeter Summa Lux. I've got a 35 millimeter Summa Cron. Mm -hmm. um, there's f1.4 versus f2. There's like all kinds of many discussions within that alone yeah, that totally. we could have. Um, I really want to focus more on the focal length in yeah. terms of everyday shooting since these are kind of our everyday carries. Um, but just for everybody at home, I need you to tell the story of getting this 50 millimeter f1.4 Summa Lux, which is a very incredible <laughs> lens. It's a lens that's been on my wish list for, I guess, the last seven years. Um, but just so everyone knows, yeah. because this is... I no, need, it I need still to... amazes me. I'm very lucky and yeah. grateful. Um, so I used to live in Yosemite, and I... Uh, knew someone that was going to go do a hike. I was like, oh, you should go do this hike or whatever. And um, when they were on that hike, they saw down the river bank, they saw something in the river. And yeah. they were like, oh, like, I wonder what that is. They walked down to it, reach in, grab uh, and pull out this lens. <laughs> out of the water. Out of the water, like couple, three feet down, no back on it, no back cap, no front cap, but it did have a red filter. So um, someone was shooting black and white film. Yeah. Because what year was this? This was, you said, what, five years ago? Uh, actually, four. Four? Four, yeah. Okay, so the monochrome cameras were out, so maybe they were shooting with a monochrome with the red filter, but... Yeah, maybe. We'd, we'd but like they're to, probably we'd like shooting to think film. they were shooting black and white film, yeah. <laughs> and so, and it, it had a dented, it still kind of does, um, a dented, uh, like but this is... That, yeah, that shaped out pretty yeah. well. Yeah, and then it was a little dented, like scraped here. And then there's some water damage. I shot with it, so I had never had a Leica. I 
didn't like have the money or the budget for it at the time. So you got the lens got before the lens. you ever got any didn't have a like camera. A camera. <laughs> I was so eager to try it out. I yeah. couldn't. Um, and then when I was down visiting the dark room, Phil Stebley, the owner of the dark room, uh, great, like, great guy. Yeah. One of the best people ever. Uh, awesome. yeah. So he has some awesome, like a couple different Leicas and yeah. You know, it's so funny thinking about it now. Like, I didn't know what I had. Right. And, like... That's what I was curious about because, you know, someone, your friend found it and, and knew you were into photography, obviously, mm -hmm. so that they were they called you. But I'm sure you knew... I knew it was expensive. You knew I to knew an extent. Good. Like, oh, it's a Leica lens. It's... You'd heard, I just thought but... it was expensive because it was a Leica. I didn't realize how good of a Leica lens it right. was. Right. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. yeah. So, Phil, let me shoot it on... I first shot it on a M3. Yeah. Uh, perfect for every FFD. yeah it was perfect yeah. it everything looked good it was a little dark um so i just always metered like half a stop to a stop more to com um, to compensate for like the water damage is that right so or? yeah there was a little bit of water damage uh to be expected for to be expected <laughs> to be underwater and you couldn't really tell until you put like a hard light like your iphone light gotcha. on and it shine through it and i shot like that for a while and got really good results. It was still, it was still very sharp. Yeah. Uh, but exposure-wise and color, I think it was a little bit off. That I would notice right. when shooting color film. Especially for a lens that is known for just how great it is. Yeah. Like you, It would be more apparent on a lens like this comparing to, a say, one that's fresh totally. out of the factory. Totally, totally. Yeah. So then when I was, I was actually talking with uh, KH and we were telling about this video and I was like, I'm gonna, I was like, telling them about this lens I was like not expecting that they would do a CLA on this on a lens yeah I, I didn't, didn't know, know that they offered that on mm -hmm. so so many different kinds of like cameras and lenses and stuff yeah me neither so I sent it in uh, talked with the, the technician and he was really cool and basically got it back a couple days ago they sent me a Sumicron APO uh, which is an amazing lens. Yeah. And it was a loner, obviously, f right. for this this camera. Yeah. And even though that camera is, in, I mean, that lens is insanely good. It is very sharp, incredibly sharp on the yeah. corners, zero Wide distortion, yeah. no vignette. It's like, a, it's, it's like a perfect 50 millimeter yeah. in terms of image quality totally. and that kind of stuff. But. But when I got this back, I was just so eager to shoot with it because it's one four, yeah. so wide open. It's and a it, lot. It uh, has such a distinct look that mm -hmm. it's not it's not in the same way of having character like you would see on a vintage lens, but it has enough character there to kind of separate like to set it apart mm -hmm. from you know some of the other offerings. So yeah, it I I think with black and white I know it's the most like because the color is not distracting right and you see the difference between this and I shoot with a polar opposite type of camera lens and that's the the nifty 50 the yeah. 50 millimeter the Canon 50 millimeter 1.8 pretty much all plastic yeah on like a Canon rebel sometime for film stuff and like I use that as like a point 15, and shoot 15 20 dollar body yeah, yeah. and the it they're polar opposites yeah. um and you can see the difference and i'm um, not that the other one's bad it's just there's a completely different look to it for sure um and it isolates it has more of a medium format look yeah. to it my friend ben heish he did a, a whole video he's a really great wedding photographer um shoots with both film and digital embodies on wedding days and he uses the 514 um, for a lot of the wedding portraits and stuff. And he did a video talking about that. And, you know, he's shot medium format film for years. And, and he was comparing it to this lens on digital or on 35 millimeter film. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's something spec like special about this lens that it does give that sort of medium format kind of separation mm -hmm. that um, the subject really just kind of pops. Yeah. Know? Well, and... You know, not to talk too much specifically because we're mainly talking about focal, focal length. Like, right, but it's but because yeah. I, I don't want people out there watching this to be like, like oh, I have to have, have to have a like I have to have right. a uh, like this specific fifty millimeter. Yeah. You know, if I this is what got me into like I didn't own a, my own body for three years after having this. Yeah. So 
I borrowed and this sat on the shelf a lot. Yeah. So, but there's other 50s in general. I gravitate towards 50 more yeah. with any camera. Honestly, right behind you, that Minolta, the XGM, oh, yeah, right that there. 50 f1.4 Rokor lens. I mean, that was like my only camera and lens for several years, mm -hmm. and that's what I learned everything on. But even several years ago, um, shooting weddings with like a digital Fuji body, I had an adapter to mount that lens. And it was like the same lens that I learned photography with That's basically, so cool. but I was able to use it on like modern weddings because it just has a special look. It's mm. not, the, it's not sharper than this lens or that lens or, you know, that wasn't it. It was just because it had a special look to it. And at the end of the day, that's, that's really what it's all about. You know? Totally. I mean, we were been talking about with film, like we were going to test to see what this looks like. Cause I still have that APO. Yeah. And I don't notice a difference personally unless I was really close maybe. Yeah. Uh, so that's, and it's also one of those things where it's like, if you're posting just on social media, doing small prints or website stuff, yeah. you could have that nifty 50, which is like a hundred dollar lens. Yeah. And you know, for the most part, people aren't gonna notice the Never difference. Never gonna know, yeah, uh, absolutely. It's just, it took me many years to even get to the point where I owned a camera that would be considered my dream camera. Same. Yeah. So like there's a level of like don't feel rushed right. to get I know. what everyone's saying is the best thing. I don't I, I'm leery of doing videos like this all right. too often because I don't want people to think that this is the pinnacle if you're not at a like a body. Exactly. That and, and that's the same thing for me with even like having a whole YouTube channel, like I, I talk about this camera a lot and now other Leica cameras, but I spent many, many, many years before mm. ever even, I wanted one for a long time, but I could never justify the price. And it wasn't until I had already been shooting for, I mean, nine years maybe, I think, mm. when I got my first. Yeah, right, uh, for me. Yeah, yeah, and it was just kind of a, you know, I took a leap and, and I'm glad and I really enjoy the camera body, but you can absolutely do amazing work with much cheaper setups, much different setups. You know, mm -hmm. again, it kind of, it's all about your personal preference. Um, but let's talk about the focal lengths in particular, because for me, 35 millimeter is sort of what I would kind of consider my perfect everyday lens, just because it gives me enough to show the environment. And mm -hmm. it wasn't, it actually wasn't until I started shooting with a rangefinder that I gravitated towards 35. Mm -hmm. Before that, I always shot with a 50. And when I got my M6, it was like, you know, what, what lens do I want? And I knew a lot of uh, Leica M shooters really preferred the 35. Mm -hmm. And I kind of like read up on it and tried to do some research. And I was like, you know, I think I'm gonna try, I'm trying something completely different with the camera body. I might as well try a different focal length yeah. to go with it. And the two, using a rangefinder in general, but especially just having that wider field of view changed a lot for me in terms of how I compose things and like, uh, what I included in the photo. Mm -hmm. I felt like for me with a 50, I was so kind of restrictive where I I was really particular about isolating things and I really didn't want too much in the frame. And 35, not having that compression to kind of clean things up or even the depth of field. I mean, you can get a shallow depth of field, but especially on this camera. Yeah, with the I was, it depends on your ISO. Yeah, and, your yeah, film speed, your light. shutter. Yeah, like I was mostly stopping the lens down anyway. And I think that just taught me a lot more about composition and layering things uh, because I couldn't, uh, you know, crop things out of the frame as easily yeah. because my frame was wider uh, and I couldn't blur things out as easily. So for me, 35 taught me a lot about context in the photo and like, including more of the scene and using that to your advantage and not just trying to, you know, sweep things out of the way, mm -hmm. essentially, you know, like 50 for me, and I still like to shoot with a 50, yeah. but it's a, it's, it's a totally different mindset that I don't look for the same kind of scenes and I don't mm -hmm. photograph things the same way. You know yeah. I mean? and Oh, totally. I mean, one, it's like, I just thought about this when you were talking about how you shot with the 50 first yeah. and most people that shoot film start out with a 50 yeah. in general, and that's because back in the day, like when this- That, that was my, I found that set right there on eBay for 50 bucks. Yeah, so. and you know, back in the day when these were coming out, the kit lens was typically a 50, yeah. and they were just fail safe, they're good, they're sharp. Great for students and yeah. classes and stuff. And with a 50, you learn 
like metering's a little bit more straightforward because it's a smaller area. Right, right. You don't right. have as much range, you don't have as much sky always. It's a smaller part. And then also with framing, like you were saying, it's easy, it's good to learn on a 50 because it forces you to think about framing. There's a little more compression. Yeah. And I feel like it'd be harder to learn on a 35 because there's so. so much more to it framing but could be wrong well i think i think for a long time that probably would be the case now i often wonder with smartphones and it's that true. wider they lens are wider yeah now it's like a 32 equivalent yeah, yeah yeah it's something wide and it's like what kind of uh influence does that have when people start point. on a phone now as opposed to years ago where ideally the, their is... first camera they pick up is going to be something with a longer lens so it's interesting to yeah, think about. Yeah, that could be like, like a shock if you've never yeah, yeah. shot telephoto. And that's funny because this is even, it's like not quite telephoto. No, but, but almost, if you're used to an iPhone yeah. or a wide lens, it is that telephoto. Would feel, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Although now with, you know, we've got like three lenses on our iPhones now mm -hmm. and they're probably going to put a fourth one on fourth soon. One, but, like a 200 but, millimeter. Yeah. But you know, it's like, it, it's just interesting how that kind of uh, affects things. But yeah, when I'm shooting with 35, it's just a, a totally different mindset as opposed to 50. And I think um, it, I kind of use it to my advantage, especially taking photos of like my kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, getting a little bit wider field of view and also increase that depth of field. I can uh, shoot a little more freely, especially in yeah. terms of focus, you know, as the kids are running around. And um, I always talk about like I like to basically pull focus to the closest distance and just know what that range you is move, like. Yeah, you move, and I you move the thing, camera yeah. rather than you know rather than actually focusing the lens, um, which works great with a rangefinder because I'm not looking through a, a blurry out of focus oh, uh, totally. viewfinder or anything. But well, and when we were walking around, I noticed, and this is probably because you have more experience with a rangefinder than I do as well. But you were quicker. Really. When you saw something, you you could take it. Yeah. And, I think there's a couple of reasons outside of the fact that you're probably better with it than I am, but the 35, the 35 is so. quicker because one, you probably hit infinity sooner. Actually, you don't, but, but I mean, it you, doesn't have the same, uh, compression. Right. So like it's that depth of field depth, is a lot, it, yeah. it's larger. And I mean, most of today I was shooting it like F8 at a thousand, yeah, you know, so it's it nice and bright. Um, giving myself a little bit of room to kind of expose for the shadows a tiny bit in some situations. But um, yeah, a lot of that is just kind of knowing if I'm at F8 and knowing like how far away I am from my subject, it's sort mm -hmm. of a quick, and that more than anything, it the 35 definitely lends to it, but it does have a lot to do with just mostly my kids. They give me a lot of practice. Yeah, you know that's what I true. Mean? I um, need to get, I, well now she, she's yeah. on the go now yeah. so like yeah for sure which that's where so the reason why i like the 50 is because i like the compression i like the like i like there, yeah i shoot with this more outdoors when i'm walking around and like like i see something across the street yeah. i don't have to cross that street right type yeah. of thing yeah because i can fill the frame faster because it's closer yeah um I like straight lines. Yeah. And we're, these are both really good lenses. So this has really good, it yeah. doesn't have as much, Not distortion, as much distortion as like a cheaper 35 millimeter, which I learned on. So like I have this mindset of like 35 millimeter has distortion. You're going to have all your lines are going to. Yeah. So, and that's something that kind of shaped why I like a 50 a little bit more, even though that wouldn't sure. happen as much with that. But I look for much more like. I'm I'm looking at things like that, like lines and angles and stuff, much more with a 50 yeah, than I do with a 35. Totally. So yeah, I get that. And for the most part, some sometimes I do wish I could go wider when I have my 50, but a lot of times I have the ability to just take 10 steps back and make that work. Yeah. And we're even talking about how I feel like it shaped me, uh, make, liking a 50 shaped me when I lived in Yosemite. Yeah. Because 50 is my favorite focal length, I thought you needed wide angle for landscape, but then I realized wide angle <sighs> meant that everything was just smaller in the frame and, and like stuff further. was far away there. So like 50 worked for me. I do really like portraits. I'm not as much of an environmental portrait. I'm a little bit closer. Yeah. So like for closer up portraits, I like 
less distortion and a little bit of more depth of field yeah or shallow depth of field so i get that with a 50 compared to a 35 i'm a little more challenged and it's outside of my preference of the look when it comes to a closer right if i was 35 i would basically would not do any headshots i would right. be stepping back showing more than environmental environment. yeah and that was something i had to learn with the 35 because for years I learned on just taking photos of my friends, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? And like doing portraits of, of friends and family members. And with a 50, that was always my instinct is I want to fill the frame. I want a tight head shot straight on just the eyes in focus. Like I loved that kind of look. I saw it a lot in skate mm -hmm. magazines and that was just, that was the kind of stuff that taught me. And then with a 35 and a rangefinder, I not only had a wider lens or a wider field of view, but then I also couldn't focus as close as mm -hmm. I could with an SLR. So I really had to like kind of just retrain myself yeah. on shooting portraits with this setup. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's another one of those things. It's a trade off. Like when I have a 50, I'm much more inclined to shoot that tight kind of mm -hmm. portrait because it's just kind of what it lends itself to. And you Not don't, to say you can't yeah, yeah, shoot yeah. 50 or use a 50 for environmental portraits. Oh, it works but. great for environmental portraits. It's you just can't always do it. Sometimes you don't have that, that space. space to back up. Right. Yeah, and especially like interiors and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You can't include as much with a, a longer lens, but. And we're also, but when we're talking about this, it's not because this is the only lens he's ever gonna focal length he's ever gonna shoot. And same for me. Yeah, like yeah. I, they all I'm have their place. Currently borrowing a thirty-five millimeter uh, yeah. from a friend that I will use every once in a while indoors when I'm like photographing my daughter and I, I need a little yeah. more like frame where like, and I know that you've even talked about getting this specific. Yeah. One, so, so right now I have a 50 Sumicron um, and I'm kind of just using that through the rest of the wedding season. And then when things slow down, I'll probably end up selling it and grabbing the Sumilux just because that's like the goal. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to get something before the weddings kind of got started and uh, you know, cause with the pandemic and everything yeah. i wasn't sure exactly what this wedding season was going to look like um but yeah that's that's like the that's the end game right there is getting into the sumalux um but let's let's talk a little bit about the film stocks themselves um i for a long time i shot tri-x um i also shot the bw 400 cn kodak c41 yeah, yeah um, because I didn't really have a, a lab, I was using Walgreens, you know, mm -hmm. and they couldn't do traditional black and white. Yeah. So it wasn't until I uh, started going to college, had access to the dark room, and started developing there, uh, and I used a lot of Tri-X then, and then even years after college, I continued to shoot Tri-X. Um, but it's been about, I want to say, about five and a half years, roughly, I'd say, that I've been shooting HP5. And initially the reason I switched was to cut the cost in half because I was bulk loading. Mm -hmm. And bulk loading HP5 yeah. dramatically cuts the cost down. Um, and at the time, I don't know what it's like now, but at the time, bulk loading Tri-X didn't really affect price. And I was like, well, I can save some money. Um, I believe Molly was pregnant at the time with Nora, so mm -hmm. saving any money that I could along the way was kind of, yeah. a, that was on my mind. And in general, there's still that still is cheaper outside of even bulk just loading. buying yeah, like yeah. to go and buy one roll is, is a cheaper. More expensive is yeah. it okay see i wasn't even aware of that i, I wasn't sure where prices were mm -hmm. on tri-x now because it's been so long since i've shot it and i still love the look of tri-x but um i started experimenting with ilford films and hp5 was one i i don't think i'd ever shot in 35 i think i'd shot maybe a roll or two in medium format at that point but mm -hmm. i was looking specifically for 35 because that's what i shoot everyday life with yeah. that's what i shoot more than anything and uh hp5 the the first thing i noticed was a little bit flatter contrast and uh more than anything in the shadows mm -hmm. the shadows weren't as like punchy really dark yeah. shadows um as opposed to to triax um I could always add that in later if I wanted to, if I wanted to really add that contrast, whether it be in a, a film scan or mm -hmm. even in the dark room. Um, but it just, it kind of worked for me. And I started to like that flatter look. Whereas if you look at older photos, when I shot Tri-X as a whole, it just looks so much more contrasting. And it, it, 
it kind of has a similar style to what I shoot mm. now, but it was a much punchier, high contrast kind of look, and that was ultimately because I was shooting Tri-X. Well, and I, I actually, it is contrasty, but I also have a theory as to why you see more contrasty scenes. Really? Because, so, like, you see, when when you talk, whenever we post about tri we show stuff that has a little more contrast than HP5. Yeah. And people know it as having, pun- like, stronger blacks, yeah, often yeah. more pure whites, like, just a wide range That's of punchy too. tones. Yeah. And... But that's also what people, since they know that, it's almost like you're trained to look for They're that. shooting for that. That makes sense. So, yeah. like, I have noticed that, like, when the first shot that I took, and you took two of that stairway. Yeah, yeah. And it's black, and then there's brick behind it, which will be a gray, and then there was white, which will be a little off-white, and then there's the sky, which will be a, probably pretty white, because yeah. it's bright right there. Um, I looked at that and like contrast. Right. And I took it. Right. Type of thing. Where like our shots would probably be pretty close in that scene. I would say so because of a, the light. It's a contrasty scene. Like, right. Like I've posted stuff with Delta and people are like, I love the contrast of this film. Like saying that they love the strong contrast. I'm like, that's not it's that, contrast. That's because of the light. That's because of the light. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think it still is more contrasty. Like if you were to photograph here and here which are black and white close right. this would have more contrast yeah yeah for but sure. there are ways of shooting this and light and scenes to photograph that True. you don't always see that contrast because yeah. there's times where i don't post stuff for the dark room as much because people would be like that's triax right and you don't want to like you don't want to confuse people yeah. because it's it's already no. i think confusing enough with all of the information ones, yeah. everywhere yeah um, but yeah, people shouldn't be afraid to shoot Tri-X because they're afraid everything is going to look like mm-hmm. you, you know, boosted the contrast slider on, in Lightroom yeah. to 100 or anything like that. Yeah, what I like about Tri-X is I like it's I, it's mainly the contrast, but I do like the grain. The grain it's is... It's classic. Yeah, it just has... It's a little chunky, yeah. but not... Too it, much. It's it, not. It's, it's not, not like, like Delta Thirty Two Hundred. It's not like fuzzy. Yeah. Kind of chunky. It still has some like sharpness to it. Yeah, it's a sharp, chunky. I don't know. <laughs> very technical terms. Yeah. Um, I and I appreciate both of these. Like I. Yeah, yeah. I like the the tones, the more subtle tones of this film of HP Five. Yeah. I actually really like HP Five in medium format. Yeah. Uh, you can push that ridiculously high mm-hmm. and it's still clean there's still plenty of of grays in there between white and black i mean it's not a you're not introducing contrast to the point of losing highlight or shadow detail like you can still hold a ton of detail and push this film specifically in medium format yeah. just incredibly high well the other thing i was thinking about with this is i actually i mean i would shoot this with 35 as well but I feel like shooting with a 50 millimeter, since we were talking about how a 50 millimeter is closer, metering wise, it's there's less range typically of light. True. And, yeah. and I often fill the frame. So if I'm photographing you here, there's there's like, you know, bright window, white, a gray, like a neutral gray right here. Yeah. I'm so close to you that I'm metering You're basically you are a shadow right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's close compared to if I was shooting it wide and there was a lot more. You're getting you a lot more, more range. Of it, That's a like, good point. Like this would possibly, could possibly do better when it comes to tonality in the highlights or the shadows. Right. But if you were close up with it, it might actually be flatter. Yeah, yeah. So it just sure. depends. It just comes down to your preference, too. I and never again, push this film, though. Yeah, you don't really need to, unless you need the speed, but, like, for the look. Yeah, I don't want... I just don't want the more... It's unfor- don't want that. <laughs> I mean, you can push it. I would... If yeah. you push this film, yeah. I recommend only pushing it when you need to. Like yeah. what you were saying. Like, if you're in low light and it's relatively even and you have to, yeah. for the shutter speed's sake... The, the first time I ever tried to push film was with Tri-X, and I was like, oh, this... You want to shoot in contrast steel? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, it was low, dim, like, uh, stage lighting. Some friends were playing mm-hmm. a show in town, and I was like, I'll just push it. I've never tried that before. Uh, this was, like, 
10 years ago probably or no it was maybe like eight years ago and uh yeah the fo I, I just i couldn't see anything i could see yeah. the tiny little bit of highlights there and i was like i didn't do this right at all i which i wasn't it was the first time doing it. I, I know I wasn't metering properly or anything, but um, it wasn't until I started shooting HP5 that I started regularly pushing film. Um, and I think a lot of that does have to do with sometimes it's a little too flat for a lot of people's taste mm -hmm. and, and pushing it does give this film um, a little bit more contrast like, like most films. Well, if you feel like this, if HP5 is too flat for you, the one thing you can do is just what you should do for the most part is air on overexposure yeah. and meet it for the shadows and you're gonna get naturally more dynamic photos yeah because it does well with the highlights but if you're like a lot of times when people get flat stuff like something that we see in the dark room um lab often is that people underexpose their black and yeah. white which can be very easy to do you hear people talking about you need to underrate it like shoot this at 100 or that at 200 or whatever right. but a lot of that's just like if you meter for the shadows make sure that you're metering for like if your subject making them neutral gray and understand that your camera is trying to make everything neutral, neutral gray. gray and how to meter for that and how to open up a stop if you don't want someone's skin to be neutral gray and right. you want it to go a little brighter, um, that's where an incident meter can help. Right. Uh, especially if you're have, photographing someone that has darker complexion. Yeah, for sure. Uh -huh. I mean, that, that's typical, um, like, you know, here in Ohio with snow during the winter and everything. Mm -hmm. If I were to load up, you know, HP5 in my M6 and I'm going out and shooting, you know, these snowy scenes. I don't want my meter, if I'm looking at a really bright white snowy scene, I don't want my meter to tell me that it has, you know, the little red dot for this is average gray. Because mm -hmm. I don't want the white snow to be average gray. Right, yeah. I, I want to air That's on the overexposure. That's where you get that flat look. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Especially so. with scanners, because scanners are, ha like, if it's underexposed, you can only do so much to bring that out. Right. For and sure. Otherwise, you're, yeah, you're working off of a, a transparent, you know somewhat anyway uh film yeah there, there's only so much you can pull out of that yeah and and the, the other thing that's cool is with this film like say like prior to t-max p3200 i would that's probably when i would have been more prone to shoot this right but then to, they came so out with a push it. yeah a faster kodak came out with one that i really liked which was t-max p3200 so that's if great. i was shooting in low light I, I can use that and I have no problem. Right. And then I'm more content shooting this at box speed and knowing what its limitations are with yeah. light. But being 400 ISO, it's still like, I can still shoot box speed at one four at a 30th of a second right. indoors. And almost most of my photos I could do that in. Right. And I'm still gonna get, so if you have fast glass, you can still make 400. Oh yeah, you can work. make that work in a lot of different ways. Yeah. Um, and even like lens choice, being able to shoot a slower speed with a wider lens because mm -hmm. you're not going to notice that any camera shake as much. And um, again, it's all it's all trade offs and kind of personal preference, and comes down to what you shoot and what kind of look you're going for. And well, like so, we actually, which you've probably seen this video, we shot uh, we shot. This is your are you on your third roll? Um, today or this is it two and a half. Uh, yeah, about two and a half. I'm about to finish the third. Yeah, and I'm on my second one. So like we shot some film in Chillicothe, mm -hmm. which is cool to see yeah. in person. And it'll be cool to see the scans, but the scans between these two to see like the difference in the look. But we also metered how we would meter and frame how we would meet frame. Yeah, so and, there's and, and we're naturally drawn to like different things. Yeah. Uh, l likely because of these choices, you know, like yeah, that could certain, be a second video. <laughs> yeah, like certain things, I would see you shooting with a fifty, and there were a couple of times where we shot the same scene, you know, mm -hmm. both with the, you know our respective setups, uh, which will be interesting to see the differences there. But some scenes, it was like, oh, that works for a fifty, it mm -hmm. doesn't really work for a thirty-five, or yeah. or vice versa. Totally. You know? So so that's just another thing that kind of ties into it, where it's going to make you see differently, not just how things look but you might not notice certain things mm -hmm. when you're thinking about a specific uh focal length you we'll know? have to get these printed too we could get the silver gelatin at the dark room yeah. yeah that would be that would be a cool follow-up um to just kind of compare the two and, I, and yeah yeah i think that actually is another thing that probably shaped me i used to get proof prints or i still do like i would order 
the prints with developing. Right. So like obviously if you want, you could download the scan, you could tweak it in Lightroom or any editing thing if you want and add it, but with proof prints it's just it's cool because it's what you shot is what you're gonna get. Right. And I like contrast well so I that's something that was nice about this is that it came with contrast okay. right out of the camera. You didn't have to add it and <laughs> compared then... to if I did underexpose or something yeah. a little bit and went a little flat, then I wouldn't have that uh, and that I think that's probably some, it's because you know with a dark room I shoot a lot of different types of film right which can get convoluted <laughs> on what to shoot but it also helps me know exactly what I like from yeah. a personal preference that's, that's what I tell people I'm like I love I, I think it's it's awesome to have a setup that you know like the back of your hand because you don't even have to think about mm -hmm. it but unless you experiment and try different kinds of combinations and film stocks and lenses and camera bodies it's not until after you try a bunch out that you really know like okay I know for sure mm -hmm. this is what I enjoy using the most or this is what gives me exactly what it is I'm looking for well yeah and tell me uh, I'd be interested to see what you think of this but like when it comes to if you're new to film or you want to try something new uh and you know, with the dark room, we have people like, "What should I shoot?" And yeah. like, a lot of times, they'll be like, "I'm gonna get HP5, I'm gonna get Triax, I'm gonna get T Max, and yeah. whatever else, yeah, like yeah. a Delta or something like that." And they do all these different things, and they shoot this in different light, this in different light, yeah. and then they're like, "This one went really contrasty, but this was shot in daylight. This one's flat, but they shot in even light." And right. So if you are trying, say you've shot HP5 and you want to try Triax, shoot one or two. Don't shoot just one. Shoot two or three. Yeah. Uh, and get a feel for it because, you know, if you're not learning how to meter for it, and same with this, if you want to try HP5 or any other film, don't just shoot it once and base it off of that. Like, that I mean, if you experience. absolutely don't like it, then yeah, don't do it. But if you're <laughs> like, I don't know, I've seen better stuff from it, you could shoot a Keep couple more, goals, more yeah. learn from it. And you being like doing so many tests for the dark room and you know for social media to mm -hmm. show people the differences of the same camera and lens but different stocks in the same light, mm -hmm. that's a really good resource to show people because again, you can't just go off of one particular setting because you can get a hundred different looks, looks with this yeah. film, just like with that film, just like with any film. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, knowing how it's going to respond in all the different kind of setups. That's how you get like a really good representation of what that film is really like and like what the true character is. Yeah. Like. I mean, we try to, it's lucky. Uh, I'm, like, I'm glad that it's already kind of my style and like, I like just as is everyday life. So it works out well. But when we post the stuff for the dark room, it's very like straight from the scan. Right. Uh, not that we have a problem if someone does anything to our scans or whatever scans and tweaks them, that's fine. It's just more of like showing like, this is the base of what you could get, a good example of what you could get, and this is the light and the gear that photo, like it was used. Right. Because that, like you said, affects it. Yeah, um, yeah. Because like, I mean, I could make this contrasty yeah. with light, you know, yeah. it just- And even in post. Yeah. yeah. So we try to do that, and that's something we show on like the film index, and we'll compare right. a lot of them. There's so many film stocks to compare. We've actually compared these two before. I was gonna say, is that on the blog? Yeah, there is a blog. There, we've had a couple posts. It's yeah. it's a touchy thing to do. Like the next time I do it, we have to do it same exact lens, same exact camera. Yeah. Because when we did it, we I've done it a few different times. One time we compared. A 40 millimeter. Um, oh, what's the Leica 40 millimeter? Oh, uh, the the Minolta had a Summicron and Leica did. Yeah, it was a 40 it was, millimeter Summicron. Yeah, yeah, so we did a Summicron and we did compared the um, that lens on an MP to the Canonet. Oh wow! <laughs> Which is and the funny thing is we showed everyone and yeah. a lot of people guessed wrong. Like really? they actually picked the Canonet. As like awesome. the, the favorite, the favorite but you know it's also an, an iPhone, so like it's hard to tell. It wasn't like blown up, right? And we compared them, but you know those two lenses have different contrast. They render differently. Exactly. Yeah, We've done so other many tests. Variables. Yeah. So in the future, that's something that we'll, we need to do another comparison. I don't do these comparisons as much because people know about them so much. Yeah. It's the, kinda these like, are your two go-to. Yeah. There's so much information out there. 
I like what we're talking about now because it's more of the philosophy as to why we would shoot them yeah, yeah. rather than what's, what's like better. What's better? Because like they're both really good. Oh yeah. It just depends on what you like, and like yeah. some people even think that this could have a little more contrast than they would want, and they go to Delta Four Hundred. Right. Yeah. I know uh, Jason Lee. He likes to pull delta film too mm -hmm. to like really get that kind of flat more gray scale yeah you know rather than a lot of contrast and that's a whole other thing you can you can do all of these different things to manipulate it so you've got a a general look already kind of like baked into mm -hmm. the film but there's still tons of room to experiment and again really kind of fine-tune it to your personal preference so i think uh yeah i mean this setup works for me, obviously. That setup works for you. Uh, hopefully, people would enjoy this, you know, long yeah. kind of conversation. We're probably about to do another long conversation on Instagram Live. Oh, yeah. I'd say. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> we do I'm this all the time. Kind of, like, cotton mouth. Yeah, and, yeah. And no, we, we do this kind of stuff, though, um, all the time on the dark room, on their Instagram. Um, it's always a good time to just be able to sit and talk photography. Totally. But I think. Picking a, a daily carry kind of setup and finding something that you're actually willing to carry every mm -hmm. single day and something that makes you want to shoot every day, um, I think that's important. So I love talking about you know what's your what's your go to daily setup. So I yeah. appreciate you sharing all this with everybody. Yeah, no problem. It's fun. I mean, this I, and it's it's fun talking with you because you have a very simple setup. Like this is your only film camera currently yeah. that you shoot with. Yeah, and that is something that you know if you are when you first start out with film it's hard like you could you have big eyes you're like i want the fm2 yeah. i want now this i want format i want to try four by five i want to yeah. then you end up with like all these cameras like dangling <laughs> off your shoulders and like you're overthinking stuff and yeah you know i've been there try out cameras times. have a great like a you know like think about don't think about what everyone says you should have right and if something works it could be a cheap canon rebel yeah. film camera i love the holga you, you fall in love with and you're like this is it yeah even though people say it's junk right yeah i know people who hate the idea of you know spending their medium format film in a plastic holga but the holga is one of my favorite cameras it's a cool, yeah, ever it a cool yeah camera. it just it's something about it but it's like yeah wh whatever you enjoy using that's that's what you should use so yeah. Uh, why don't you go ahead and tell people where they can find you on Instagram and all that stuff. Well, personally, it's... Trev personally, yeah. Okay. Personally, it's Trevly, T-R-E-V-L-E-E. -E. And then... Everything for the dark room you do. And then everything for the dark room. Like, pretty much everything I do personally and work-wise ends up going there's into a, the dark room. There's a lot of to overlap a certain extent. there. Yeah, there yeah. is a lot of overlap, which is a good thing in my opinion because it's I'm learning with you guys like, right you know when people see especially in the beginning you know Phil and that they're like shoot slide film shoot this film that you've never shot before shoot more black and white yeah. and I've been pushed out of my comfort zone to try different things to try different cameras um, to be open-minded to creative effect films and right. go out there and shoot that even though it's not my personal preference but find a way to appreciate that and share it for people and share it for other people to learn I yeah it's huge i know a ton of people who have either just gotten into film or people that have been doing it for a long time mm -hmm. and the dark room just the dark room on instagram alone has become a great resource for film photography because it covers all these grounds mm -hmm. you know it's not just here's your fuji 400h at a wedding or Hashtag here's your film. Yeah, yeah yeah exactly like it's it's very broad in the kind of stuff that you guys shoot and share and uh it's a great resource you know so and that's that's something i try to encourage other people to do as well you do a good job of, at it but there's so many people that shoot film but there's also so many people that are learning to do that right where like it's not like digital film is so much different and it's like encouraging to and good for the film community to know how things are made yeah to be absolutely. like this is the film this is the camera this is 
and if like you want to start that conversation conversation like this is how I metered for it so people understand and that's pretty much our goal with the dark room is to let people know how like everything that we post is attainable yeah like I don't want to post something that's like you can't do this you right, can't buy yeah. this camera it's yeah, more of like you, you, you could do you this photo anytime anywhere yeah you put so, all of the information out there which is good there are no secrets you just gotta practice and yeah get your get your hands dirty so to speak so uh, thank you for sharing all that. Yeah, I hope no, you guys enjoyed this one. Um, yeah, you can let us know what you think, what your daily, everyday setup is in the comments, and uh, what you would prefer, 35 or 50, or fit, or you know, Tri-X versus HP5. Or uh, none. Or none <laughs> at all. I totally suck. get that, yeah. Uh, yeah, let us know what you think in the comments. Uh, that's it for today, so thank you guys. I'll see you next time.